stronger than a drug. Boom, you literally glue to whatever you're looking at. Here's how victims can conquer their sexual addictions. Anybody can be free if they're willing to do the work. Plus, a devastating diagnosis. Maddox has tumors in his eyes. That this mom refused to accept. That's not the future I wanted him to have. Watch a miracle unfold. Everybody in the room was just like, it was amazing. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. The Iowa caucuses were interesting. Biggest turnout I think they've ever had. 180,000 people turned out uh, for that uh, caucus. And my takeaway, although Cruz won it, the winners of those things, Huckabee won, didn't go anywhere much. He won a few states. Uh, Santorum won, but uh, he didn't go anywhere except won a few states. Um, I don't think Cruz's win is going to take him to the White House, but we'll see. It'll be interesting. But it apparently shattered the, the myth of the invincibility of Donald Trump. He's going to have a hard time uh, recovering that aura that surrounded him, but we'll see what it is. And then Hillary Clinton barely pulled out a win. That's Terry. right. She and <clears throat> Bernie Sanders are actually tied Amazing. this morning. And um, so that certainly wasn't what people expected. Heather Sells has a look at the results for both parties. Compared to 2012, 60,000 more Iowans showed up for the GOP caucuses this year, and two-thirds were evangelical. That clearly helped Senator Ted Cruz, who edged past rivals Donald Trump and Marco Rubio for the victory. Tonight is a victory for courageous conservatives across Iowa and all across this great nation. He just had a message that really resonated, I think, with the people of Iowa, uh, constitutional conservatism. I think people see his integrity. They see he's, he's true and real. He's a real person. He's not just some politician up there. The caucuses delivered second place to Donald Trump, who responded with uncharacteristic modesty. We finished second. And I want to tell you something, I'm just honored. I'm really honored. And they validated the campaign of Marco Rubio, finishing with a strong third place, just one percentage point behind Trump. Tonight we have taken the first step, but an important step, towards winning this election. Notably, the caucuses delivered a final blow to former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who called it quits. On the Democratic side, Iowans delivered the closest results ever in their state Democratic caucus history, with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders finishing in a virtual dead heat. The neck and neck results were a disappointment for Clinton, who had hoped for a clear victory, and brought back memories of her 2008 loss in Iowa to Barack Obama. But she promised to keep fighting. I am excited about really getting into the debate with Senator Sanders about the best way forward to fight for us and America. The people of Iowa have sent a very profound message to the political establishment. For both parties, that anti-establishment message cannot be ignored. And neither can the New Hampshire primary just seven days away. Conventional wisdom says it may provide friendlier territory for Sanders and Trump, but this, of course, is anything but a conventional year. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, thanks, Heather. And uh, we have with us our political correspondent, David Brody. Uh, he's gaining quite a lot of statue for his uh, analysis of the evangelicals. And David, it's good to have you with us today. Heather, what's your take on these results out of Iowa? Well, first of all, Pat, let me just say I carry a bottle of Excedrin with me uh, at all times during this campaign. It's been <laughs> one of those campaigns for sure. Uh, look, I, I think the bottom line here on all of this is that Ted Cruz had a phenomenal ground game, a phenomenal ground game. Uh, and he started this early. Often he was mobilizing pastors. He had precinct captains. He has $18 million now to go on to New Hampshire and other places. He's got a lot of money. He is not Huckabee. He is not Santorum because he's got 
got money to back it up going forward. And what he did in Iowa was because of the money that was coming in. And so th this is a clear victory for Ted Cruz. Uh, then the question really becomes what happens to Donald Trump and Marco Rubio going forward. But I have to tell you, uh, the, Iowa has scrambled this whole thing. It, this thing is wide open. I mean, Ted Cruz can claim victory for sure. Marco Rubio can also, in a way, claim victory for doing so well, almost second place in Iowa here and coming on strong. And then Donald Trump, let's be honest with Donald Trump. Whoever thought Donald Trump would even be in the race, uh, be in this Iowa race to begin with, let alone come in second in evangelical heavy Iowa. And then he's polled, polling very well in New Hampshire. So, boy, uh, we've got a race on our hands, Pat. Uh, did you talk to his people about whether it was a mistake to pull out of the uh, Iowa debate? What, what did they tell you? Well, they're not going to say it's a mistake at all. Ha having said that, Ted, Cruz is, Ted Cruz's campaign has some internal polling suggesting that indeed it was a mistake, not a huge blunder, uh, but something that hurt at the margins. And if you actually look some, inside some of those internal polling numbers, not internal, I should say exit polls, most of the folks that were voting at the last moment, those ones that hadn't made up their mind, were actually going for Marco Rubio and then Ted Cruz. They were not going for Donald Trump. So he needed to be in that debate. I don't think there's any question about it. So it hurt him at the margins for sure, Pat. Uh, Rubio has a strong statement to evangelicals. His faith in Jesus Christ is real. And uh, uh, he did he make a deliberate outreach or that was just his way of talking about himself? You know, it's fascinating, Pat. This all turned on a dime for Marco Rubio in November. As a matter of fact, uh, one of his campaign uh, senior advisors told me that when CBN cameras were inside that room, uh, inside the room with pastors and Marco Rubio, it was a private meeting. CBN was the only one there. And some of that video got out and people got to see what Marco Rubio was all about regarding his faith. That was a game changer, they believe, in this campaign. That's what they told me uh, privately, and I'm sure it'll be public very soon. But the bottom line is Marco Rubio ha does have a faith story to tell, and it was on display here in Iowa, especially in the last couple of months. Uh, it is real. It's from his heart. And as a matter of fact, some of these videos from our CBN News camera have gone viral, if you will, uh, where he talks about his faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, the fact that his Roman Catholic faith was actually infused uh, by going to an evangelical church and attending an evangelical church with his wife. And they also go to both Roman Catholic Church and evangelical uh, churches as well. David, uh, going forward, who's got the clout? Uh, you know, let's look at the Democrats for a minute. Uh, Hillary uh, was just way ahead of everybody, and all of a sudden, here comes a socialist senator from Vermont uh, and gets these huge crowds. Going to New Hampshire, it looks like Bernie Sanders is way ahead in the polling. What do you see about that? I don't think there's any question about it, Pat. Bernie Sanders is poised to win New Hampshire. And, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton is, is being called the apparent winner, in quotes, apparent winner of uh, Iowa. But, boy, it didn't feel like a win at all. As a matter of fact, it felt like a loss. And, and so here along comes Bernie Sanders in New Hampshire, going to do very well there. He will most likely win there. And then it gets into the Deep South, where Hillary Clinton does well. But clearly, inside the Clinton campaign, they are very concerned uh, about how this went on in Iowa. You know, she came out uh, last night with Bill Clinton and Chelsea Clinton kind of in a way, in essence, pro proclaiming victory. Well, it really wasn't much of a victory at all. So, so this, this whole shakeup with, with uh, Hillary Clinton, think about this for a second, Pat. You know, I mean, uh, she was up by 50 points <laughs> in the polls when all of this started, and now she won by 0.2 percentage points. Uh, as they say, uh, oi gewalt. <laughs> well, thanks. You can keep it up, and uh, it's on to New Hampshire another week or so, and then down to South Carolina. The, the big states are still yet to come. Uh, Iowa is a bellwether, but it hadn't, didn't help Huckabee. It didn't help Santorum, and it didn't help Pat Buchanan, and it didn't help me. So I understand how it is. Uh, well, one of the key issues of this year's presidential race will be the economy. By the way, from what I was reading, our national debt has now hit $19 trillion, $19 trillion. And now a new report says the United States is losing still more of its economic freedom. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. That's right, Pat. The U.S. has fallen out of the top 10 countries around the world in terms of economic freedom. That's according to the latest index of economic freedom published each year by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. The U.S. came in at number 11 this year, its worst showing ever. When President Obama took office in 2009, the U.S. was number six. 
Critics say the growing burden of regulations and the exploding national debt have tied down the economy. Well, the Zika virus is now officially an international public health emergency. Lori Johnson has the breakdown of what you need to know about the rapidly spreading illness and how CBN's Operation Blessing is offering a helping hand. The World Health Organization declared the mosquito-borne Zika virus an international health emergency. In South America, it's linked to approximately 4,000 devastating birth defects, mainly microcephaly, which causes babies to be born with abnormally small heads. After a review of the evidence, the committee advised that the clusters of microcephaly and other neurological complications constitute an extraordinary event and a public health threat to other parts of the world. The WHO hopes to raise awareness and scientific understanding about a disease that appears to only harm babies born to women who contract it during pregnancy. In fact, women in some affected areas are being advised not to become pregnant for up to two years. Scientists are working on a Zika vaccine, but it isn't expected to be available for years. That means for now, the best way to prevent getting Zika is to avoid being bitten by a mosquito. The outbreak is currently centered in Central and South America. The CDC advises pregnant women to avoid those areas, including popular vacation spots like Mexico and the Caribbean. They admit it's possible, even likely, that we will see limited Zika outbreaks in the U.S. and recommend expectant mothers wear long sleeves, long pants, use insect repellent, screens, and air conditioning. CBN's Operation Blessing is on the ground in Zika-infected areas, trying to minimize the outbreak in a number of ways. In El Salvador, volunteers canvas neighborhoods spraying for mosquitoes. They also distribute insect repellent and mosquito nets to pregnant women. The other thing that we are doing is we actually are working with our partners, the Mayo Clinic, to produce public service announcements. And what that will do is air on El Salvador TV. Operation Blessing is also educating people in person about the dangers of standing water becoming breeding grounds for mosquitoes carrying the Zika virus. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And Pat, officials in Brazil, which is hardest hit, are especially concerned about how the virus might impact a big event they're hosting this summer, the Olympics. Well, I tell you, this may shock some people, but I think we could say that Richard Nixon uh, was able to kill more people than probably Adolf Hitler and uh, uh, Joseph Stalin combined. Did you in know that? What, in what way? What do you mean? Because the United States got together with other countries and we led the charge to ban DDT. Oh. And DDT was extremely effective in killing mosquitoes. And you remember there was a lady named Rachel Carlson who wrote a book called The Silent Spring. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It shocked everybody. The little birds aren't singing and therefore the spring is silent. And we've killed these birds with this dreadful DDT. So they petitioned the United States president and he and his people went to the United Nations and got a UN ban against this very effective pesticide. We were killing mosquitoes. There was no problem. So the UN banned it. So what happens? There's an outbreak of malaria. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who have malaria and die from it. And now you've got this Zika virus. And instead of coming back with something that's effective, we go through all this rigmarole about wearing heavy clothes and everything. All we've got to do is reestablish, reinstate a pesticide that worked. That's what bureaucracy will do to you. The wrong decision at the highest levels of our government have cost the lives of hundreds of thousands, yea, millions of people. And now this dreadful disease, who knows what it's going to do to the unborn babies. This hydrocephalic situation is very serious. And uh, if this thing sneaks up into the southern part of the United States, who knows how bad it's going to hurt us. DDT, it worked. Terry? Well, up next, it's every man's battle, but there's a way men can win the war. 
Sexual addiction is probably one of the hardest addictions to walk out of, but one bad day of being honest is better than decades of struggling. That's right. Hear baby. how addicts can come clean. That's next. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. And uh, sometimes we shock you, and sometimes we try to help you. And here's something that I think will shock and help you. Sex addiction. Addiction to sex? Well, it happens to be one of the most powerful addictions you can imagine. And it affects everyone, including Christians and pastors. But what if you could beat that addiction and double your income or even change the world? Paul Strand talked to a leading authority who says there's hope for sex addicts and that freedom is possible. Watch this. Sex addiction can hook its victims in a much worse way than other vices, such as drugs or alcohol. CBN News went to one of the world's most renowned experts to find out why. Sexual addiction is probably one of the hardest addictions to walk out of because it's part of who you are. Drugs is not part of who you are. Alcohol is not part of who you are. something you do. Sexuality is part of who you are. When it comes to a sex addiction, you'd think at least the addicts find great pleasure from it. But in many cases, they feel horrible about it and trapped and imprisoned by it. We caught up with Dr. Doug Weiss, head of the American Association for Sex Addiction Therapy at a marriage enrichment retreat in Rockaway, New Jersey. He explained why this is so hard to break. The scripture says when we sin sexually, we sin against our own body, okay? What happens is you get these endorphins and encephalins, hits the excitement center of your brain, and boom, you literally glue to whatever you're looking at. Well, if that's an object, now you've created an appetite for an object, and that can create lust, sin, and death in your life. Okay, that's James 1.15. That's the scripture that says in full, then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. As Weiss points out, this is serious and hard to beat. The actual sexual chemical is stronger than anything you can take. Many addicts stay addicted because they believe there's no way they could ever break out of it. Weiss knows that's not exactly true because he escaped the cycle. I was conceived in adultery. So that, you know, you don't start off well there. And then I was uh, put in foster homes. I was uh, sexually abused. I was alcohol, drug addict, sex addict. And he has a message for others. They could get better. They could have a fantastic life. They could be free from uh, pornography and sexual addiction. I've been free for 29 years. I've set thousands of people free, you know, seeing them get well. But as he told this group in a men-only session, you can't do it alone. Anybody can be free if they're willing to do the work. But the first work is getting honest. And a lot of Christians, we're not confessing our faults one to another. We're not talking about what's going on. Weiss writes in his book, Clean, I was in Bible school and yet still fully sexually addicted. I tried, cried, fasted, prayed, and memorized scripture, but still I would fail again and again. He'd confess over and over to the Lord, but couldn't find healing till he fully accepted James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's hope once we open the door of telling somebody, this is what's going on with me. And tens of thousands of guys have taken my word for that, and they have told somebody, and they start to get free. But why says you'll still face struggles, so take the next steps. Stay in prayer and in the Bible. Be accountable. Get into support groups. We have support groups all over the country called Freedom Groups, and there's other kinds of support groups all across the country. Weiss tells groups the rewards of freedom are awesome and points out what the resurrected Jesus told a church afflicted with sexual sin in Revelation. If you just die to that thing, kill that, and just live for me, and don't try to be duplistic sexually, be monogamous sexually, then I'll give you authority over the nations. He says his own life shows it. That's what we do. We help healing others from sexual addiction all across the globe. He says freedom will also make your marriage better and very likely bring you prosperity. Most of the guys I work with double their income in 12 months of being free. How could the two possibly be linked in recovering addicts' lives? Their self-esteem goes up, their creativity goes up, their spiritual and moral and emotional maturity, their marriage level uh, satisfaction is higher. So they're just much more productive beings. And without the guilt and shame, without the thing that says, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me, eating at you every day, you are free to create, you are free to prosper, you are free to connect. And the favor of God comes on your life. Why says to get there will take swallowing your pride and opening up. It's gonna hurt, but one bad day of being honest is better than decades of struggling. But many addicts stay addicted for decades because they are so afraid of that one moment of telling the truth. So anybody can get free if they'll get honest and they get accountable. I started accountability with my roommate in seminary. And then you start getting free. And free is so much better than trapped. 
Boy, that's a great word. But I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a pretty mature group. And the, the idea that some town gossip will get hold of uh, the confession of somebody in a small group like that, confessing to one another, and the next thing you know, that person's reputation is ruined. So uh, it's, it's a tough thing. But that brother was bringing the truth. Confess your sins to one another. Uh, but th th this is a... Uh, pervasive thing now, and uh, it's, it's affecting. Uh, you know, the Bible says he made a, a show of them openly triumphing in his cross. Jesus Christ made a show of the sins of mankind openly, and he triumphed in his cross. Uh, but at the same time, he wasn't giving a litany of his sexual sins while he was on the cross. If he had any, I don't know, the Son of God, maybe he had none whatsoever. But nevertheless, whatever thoughts were there uh, for humanity, he died in your place and he died in my place to take the penalty for all the sin that we have. We have um, a booklet called uh, Trapped in Temptation. And uh, we'll give this to you free. All you have to do is call in. And this may help you if it, if it helps. I mean, it's a free book, no money involved in it. 1-800-759-0700. Uh, uh, Terry, you know, uh, Dr. Dobson, uh, his people did a survey uh, of the pastors that they deal with. And the percentage of pastors who are involved in sexual addiction was just astounding. I'm talking about pornography, which is mm -hmm. primarily what yeah. they're doing. Well, recently, the, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the same study, but a study came out saying that half of the pastors are involved in Internet porn. And all, now I realize mm -hmm. that's a broad statement yeah. from statistics, but all youth pastors. I mean, you know, if you're on the computer today, it's pretty hard to avoid I, I some of that. I think that's a little extreme, frankly. That's, that's yeah, a little it does too, sound extreme. Yeah, but uh, th this is, is absolutely much worse than cocaine. It's worse than heroin. It's worse than all these other drugs. It is a drug, and what that brother was saying, and I hadn't thought of it in that Fashion well, you know, one of the things he also said that I think is so that? important today is accountability. Yeah. To have an accountability partner, somebody trustworthy that you can share your heart with, you know, that relationship then becomes a trusted place where yeah. you can be honest well, about it's, it's what you're a, struggling with. Phew. All right. We want to help you. And, we uh, do. If, if you need, if you want prayer, you want somebody to pray with, you can, the thing about it, you can call up and be just as anonymous as you want to be. You don't have to give any name. You don't have to give any address. And just to look, I, I've got this problem. Would you pray for me? And one of these people on the phones, many of them have suffered and struggled and overcome the same things you've got. So they're here to pray for you. Terry? Well, up next, a child who is acting strange, and the doctors knew the reason why. When we examined this young boy, we saw his eyes, both eyes were filled with cancer. Watch as this boy gets healed in the blink of an eye. That's next. Tara Poe heard devastating news from her son's doctors after he was diagnosed with cancer. She was told that her baby was only going to get worse. But Tara refused to believe that. And nine months later, doctors couldn't believe what happened next. On January 1st, 2011, Tom and Tara Poe were celebrating the new year with the birth of their son, Maddox. It was surreal. We were just super excited. This was our first child together, so it was a really beautiful bonding moment for our family. But when Maddox was seven months old, Tom and Tara started noticing something wasn't right with their son. I remember a moment when I was holding him and looking down at him and looking in his eyes, and I just didn't feel that bond that I knew I should feel when I looked at my child. If I called his name, he would look, but he wouldn't be looking at me. He'd be looking kind of in the area. After a thorough examination, their pediatrician referred them to an eye specialist. He looked in his eyes, and then he kind of just sat back and took a deep breath, and then he said, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but Maddox has tumors in his eyes, and that's why he can't see. And then I looked back at the doctor, and I said, is he going to be okay? He told me, I can't tell you that for sure. That 
was probably the worst day of my life. I was so angry and like almost yelling, why, why is this happening? The specialist then sent them to the Wills Eye Institute in Philadelphia, where they met Dr. Carol Shields. When we examined this young boy, we saw both eyes had advanced retinoblastoma. His eyes, both eyes were filled with cancer. The good news was the cancer hadn't spread, and Dr. Shields told the couple that six months of systemic chemotherapy should eliminate it completely. But there was a chance their son could lose one or both of his eyes. When I thought about Maddox being blind for the rest of his life, that terrified me because that's not the future I wanted him to have. And so I prayed from the very beginning, thank you God that Maddox can see everything perfectly out of both of his beautiful eyes. And that's just what I would say over and over again. And I really, truly believed it. By the end of chemo, the tumors were gone, but there were still signs that the cancer could return. Then eight months later, another tumor appeared in Maddox's right eye. It was treated successfully with radiation, but the side effects were severe. We cured the cancer, but then he's left with all this swelling in his eye. And in his case, his retina was all blistered up. And when it gets blistered up, we call that retinal detachment. There would be probably an 80 to 90% chance he would lose his eye. I wasn't prepared and I just, I felt sick. I felt scared. And I just remember looking at her and saying, He's not gonna need his eye removed. He said, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna pray to God for a miracle and he's not going to need his eye removed. I was really sort of amazed by her belief. And, you know, I would chuckle and I'd say, well, you know, getting back to medicine, medically, scientifically, he is at risk to lose this eye and she would shake her head and say, I really don't think that's going to happen. One day, Tom and Tara were at home watching the 700 Club when Gordon Robertson started praying. So there's, so there's somebody with um, blistering on your eyeball, and it's a particular problem in your right eye, and God is, is healing that blistering now, and all that pain and discomfort and inability has turned into ability and comfort, and you're pain-free now. In Jesus' name, just receive that. I felt joy because God's given us signs that he's here and he's gonna, you know, heal him and take care of him. One month later, Tom and Tara watched and waited as Dr. Shields and her team took a careful look at Maddox's eye. I examined him with my scopes and I was looking and I looked at my assistant and I said, his detachment's gone. No fluid, no detachment. It, w it was a little bit shocking that it spontaneously went away and went away so fast. Everybody in the room was just like, <laughs> like smiling and like, it was amazing. I started laughing a little bit because I was just like, whoa, it really, this really happened. Since then, Maddox hasn't had any problems with his eyes and enjoys wrestling and playing video games with his two brothers. This was an amazing situation that happened. Some things in science are not explainable by scientific reasoning. And, you know, sometimes we just look at each other and scratch our heads and say, you know, someday we'll realize scientifically what exactly happened. It's just, um, I mean, a miracle, obviously, but I just, I know, I feel now that I know Jesus and God on such a personal level. I mean, honestly, I, I have no doubts that uh, God can do anything. Scientifically, what happened is the God who created that little boy and created our yeah. minds to reason superseded it all and did a miracle. He does that. You know, Gordon didn't know that little boy, no. didn't know the family, didn't know about the eye, didn't know anything about him, but God knew it. Mm -hmm. And God spoke the Word, and that Word is spoken. That's how creation came into being. And Jesus said, you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. You can say to a mountain, be removed, and it'll obey you, and nothing will be impossible for you. 
Now, here's some other testimonies, and then we want to pray for you. All this right. is an amazing one to me, and it should be to you, too, because we've both had people in our families that have had torn rotator cuffs. Yeah. This is Susan, who lives in Minster, Ohio, scheduled to have surgery for a torn rotator cuff. A few weeks before the surgery, Susan received a call from the CBM Prayer Center. We often call our partners. Yeah. And yeah. They asked if there might be anything she'd like to pray about. When she mentioned her shoulder, the caller prayed for her. Almost immediately, her shoulder began to feel better. Soon, it wasn't hurting at all. Susan called the doctor and canceled the surgery, and she's not having any problem. That's a miracle. Well, here's another one. There's a lady named Linda. She lives in San Diego, and uh, she pricked her finger, and it got worse and worse. The doctor said, it looks like MRSA has, has entered into that pinprick, and uh, you may need an operation or whatever. She called our 700 Club for prayer, and guess what? The Lord healed her, the wound closed, and she is praising God. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, I believe God. I believe God. I know He's the one who created everything. And if He can bring a galaxy into being by His Word, why don't you think He can fix your shoulder or heal a wound in your leg? This is nothing for him. So Terry and I are going to join hands. We're going to believe God right now. I join with my sister in Christ in the name of Jesus. And we come against the sickness and disease that's in the bodies of people right now. Terry, you've got something. There's someone, you've had a, um, some kind of a stomach issue that's required you actually having a feeding tube. God's healing that condition for you. You're going to actually be able to eat again. Well, maybe it's along the same line, Terry, but uh, the, somebody's got a bowel obstruction, and, and, obstruction and, and this has caused a great deal of bloating and swelling. That whole thing is going to be resolved even as I speak in the name of Jesus. Someone else, but you have a chronic case of rosacea. You've had it your whole life, but not anymore. God's healing you. Your skin's going to be as clear as a newborn baby's. Right now, people are troubled, and God is saying, my peace I'm going to give unto you. The peace of God is going to descend into your life right now. Charlie, you'll have peace. Mary, you'll have peace in the name of Jesus. Nicole, you will have peace. There will be peace in your home and peace in your heart. May the peace of God come into your life right now in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Wherever you are, give us a call. We're here all, all day long. Somebody, and I say, and we, I mean, the, the CV shows that on the air, but our counselors are here all day long. And they're here to pray for you. They love to pray for you. And they, they really have faith. So call if you want to just give us a testimony. It's 1 800 759 0700. Here's Terry. Well, still ahead, a boy is left to fend for himself after being abandoned by his mother. See how you helped give him a new life when we return. Mm -hmm. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Saeed Abedini says he loves his wife and he's praying for healing and restoration in their marriage. On Saturday, Saeed issued a statement to the Idaho Statesman newspaper about his wife Nagme's allegations of marital abuse. He wrote, while I am far from perfect as a man or a husband, I am seeking every day to submit to God as he molds me into what he wants me to be. He also said much of what Nagme wrote in her Facebook posts and subsequent media reports is not true. Nagme has filed for legal separation from Saeed, who was recently released from Iranian prison. Saeed says he will continue to seek reconciliation. And you can read his full statement at CBNNews.com. The government of the United Kingdom is now letting scientists conduct gene editing experiments on human embryos. Right now, the goal is not to produce modified babies, is to find answers to improve fertility treatments. The human embryos will be killed after each experiment. Opponents of the landmark decision say it could open the door to designer babies down the road and say it's already bad enough that human lives will now be created and destroyed for experiments. British scientists will now be allowed to edit genes by deleting or replacing bits of DNA inside living human cells. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to CBNNews.com. 
Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Roger is a boy from Peru who feels the pangs of hunger all the time. What's worse, his own mother abandoned him. Roger could have been ruined for life. Instead, he now has a village full of people who love him and plenty of food, so he never has to go hungry again. When Roger came to live with his grandparents, he rarely got enough to eat. But that wasn't the greatest challenge he would face. His emotions are still raw as he remembers the day his mom left. She found a boyfriend. Then she had an engagement. Then she went away. And I never saw her again. To escape his pain and his hunger, the nine-year-old spent lots of time away from the house. His grandma acknowledged how hard it's been to provide for her grandson. Some days there was nothing. I gave him the last bit of rice. Many times Roger went hungry. Then someone invited Roger to a place called The Village. It's a ministry supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise that helps some of the neediest kids in Iquitos, Peru. I had no friends to play with before. Now, here at the village, I have a million friends. Last year, CBN's Orphan's Promise not only supported the center, we also helped to expand it. Now, Monday through Friday, the kids receive lunch and a snack and are taught about the love of Jesus through CBN's Superbook programs which have now been translated into Spanish. I like it because he heals the sick and makes food come down from heaven to feed the crowds. One day after watching another episode, Roger prayed to receive Jesus as his savior and for something else. After one superbook, I asked Jesus to take the sadness away. He listened to me and made me happy. I am so happy when I see him praying. There is a great change in him. Roger likes to invite kids from his neighborhood to the Orphan's Promise Center, too. I brought three friends to the village. One of them received Jesus. I thank God for giving me a grandma and Orphan's Promise for making me a happy boy. Orphan's Promise is CBN's outreach to vulnerable and orphaned children around the world. And we want to say thank you for helping us touch and change the lives of kids like Roger. You know, not only are they being fed and clothed and educated, it was really exciting to walk into this village. I was just there a couple of weeks ago and to see all these children watching Superbook in Spanish and singing the Salvation Song at the end of it. You're a part of all of that when you join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And while that may not seem like a lot to you, when we all link arms together, you're touching and changing communities and nations. And we want to say, go to your phone and call now if you're not part of it. You're missing out on a great opportunity to make a huge difference in the lives of people in need. That's just one place in Iquitos, Peru. But really, CBN is all around the world. As Pat says, the, ne the sun never sets on it because we're in every aspect of the world. And we just invite you to be a part of that. Go to your phone and call. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-759-0700. When you join the 700 Club, there are lots of different club levels you can choose from. But whatever club level you join, we want to send you Pat's latest DVD. It's called Heaven, What God Has Prepared for Those Who Love Him. Pat teaches on here from the Word of God. And there are firsthand accounts here of people who have had medical conditions. They've died and they've come back to life. And they've talked about what's happened when they've gone to heaven and seen a little bit of what God's prepared for us. We want you to have this. So join the 700 Club. You'll be making a difference in the lives of thousands and thousands of people. Up next, we're going to bring it on. Becky says, my friend told me she can see ghosts. Is that biblically okay? Pat's going to tackle that question and more as soon as we return.
Well, we want to take a few minutes to answer some of your email questions as we bring it on today. Pat, this first one comes from Denise, who says, Will we go to heaven without the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Will just saying the sinner's prayer be enough? If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all has become new. He that hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but is passed from death into life. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say anything in there about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He that uh, believes, you know, me and him who sent me has everlasting life. Uh, the minute you are born again, you're in on the express for New Jerusalem, so count on it. What else? This is Becky who says, my friend told me she can see ghosts. Is that biblically okay? Not to my knowledge. They had people that had so-called familiar spirits. These were like Andy Mame and so forth. And these, these spirits would uh, replicate the people who are alive, but they're demonic. I, I don't think that any a uh, Christian needs to be in touch with uh, ghosts and, mm -hmm. and departed spirits and all this stuff. I don't think it's, it's Uncle George or Annie Mame or any of those people. I think they're demons uh, masquerading as people. And uh, it's not good. What else? This is John who says, what does the Bible say about age difference in dating and marriage? <laughs> the Bible says nothing about dating because they didn't date. Uh, they were given by fathers uh, to prospective husbands who paid a dowry and all the rest of it. Um, it was a family affair. Now, there are some things... Uh, you know, Abraham was 100 and his wife Sarah was 90, so there was a 10 year difference. And then later on, you know, the Bible says David was in his 70s. And I love that term. He said, he, quote, get him no heat. <laughs> so they said, well, we, we, we haven't got any of those electric blankets, so we'll find a young virgin and we'll turn her loose and keep him warm. But uh, she apparently was married to him, but uh, he had a, a stable of, of, of wives uh, in those days. But uh, I don't see there's any problem. People are worried about age differences in, in relationships. Uh, many older men in the Bible were married to young girls. Mm -hmm. the, that's true. The, the, it's, that's the way it was. Okay. This is a viewer who says, Dear Pat, I understand that sin is sin, but my question to you is, do saved Christians have sin on their resume in the eyes of God? Does God see the blood when he sees a born-again Christian who commits sexual sin? And also, I want to know, when we do sin, do we fall into grace? I would fall into grace. That's a nice term. <laughs> um, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continuously cleanses us from all sin. That's the biblical answer. Our sins are forgiven. They are placed in the sea of God's forgetfulness. God doesn't hold against us. And what is it he said? He wants us to... Uh, have a clear conscience that we are freed from past sins that we might serve the living God. Uh, God doesn't hold these things against us. Thank God he doesn't. So whatever you've been doing, I'm sure you feel guilty because of it. Just know that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's Bible. Let's believe him. Okay? That's all the time we have for all this right. for today, but thank you. Well, you know, I, I met a young man one time. He was, his body was, I mean, he was, shoulders were slumped over, his head was hanging. And uh, I started talking to him and I said, uh, they, your father told you you were a loser, didn't he? And he said, yeah. And I said, you want to know something? I said, what's, he said, what's that? I said, your old man was a liar. He said, he was? I said, yes, he was a liar. God Almighty has got a different plan for you, and in, in God you're a winner. Well, Richard Green was first labeled a loser by somebody close to him, his own mother. Parents can do that to kids. And a lifetime of failure followed in Richard's feet. 
And over the years, he became a slave of cocaine until a simple prayer delivered him in an instant. There was a lot of pain, a lot of anger, a lot of violence in our home. My name was never Rick. I was always a cuss word. You're just a dumb kid. The youngest of 11 children, Rick Green remembers the sting of verbal and physical abuse inflicted by his alcoholic mother. You can't do nothing right. I was always belittled. I was always humiliated. Somebody was always crying. And at times there were blood drawn. There was one bright spot in his young life. Daddy was the one that woke us up and took us to church. Even though he was a functioning alcoholic, he loved on us. And as a child, you never forget that. Still, the relentless abuse left Rick convinced that he was a failure. Making it worse was a learning disability that went ignored. I remember telling teachers, how did I pass? And they would just ignore me, and they just kept passing me. And by the time I got to the 10th, 11th grade, I just dropped out because I was so humiliated. Rick also started using cocaine to escape. You can't even describe the euphoria. It's indescribable. Every negative pain left, gone. At 19, he married and started a family. Rick worked temp jobs, but feeding his addiction was his priority. I wasn't eating. I was skinny. My skin didn't look good. You know, you look like you live. I looked like a slave to Satan. Rick eventually left his family, knowing he was only harming them. Reality hurt too much. Reality was too heavy because you had to look at you and what you've become and how many people you truly hurt. And I couldn't deal with the pain of four boys that had to be asking their mom where dad at. For more than a decade, Rick was in and out of jail on child support violations. Just more reminders that he was a complete failure. I was angry with my mother and I was angry with me that I had let myself get this bad. And I was angry because I hurt this woman, my first wife. He was getting ready to appear in court once again and decided to get high to soften the blow. But this time, Rick decided he'd had enough. I know it's an old cliche. I just got tired of being tired. Something had to change. And for the first time, I cried out to God, please remove the desire from alcohol and drugs and cigarettes from me. I don't want to live like this no more. And instantly, my desire was gone. And I went over the toilet, and I just got rid of the cocaine, and I pulled my beer, and I broke my cigarette, and I said, Father God, cleanse my tongue, and I've never cussed again. No one can tell me God isn't real, because nobody can do that on their own. Rick asked the Lord for forgiveness and gave him his life. He then went to court and was sentenced to six months. During that time, he read the Bible and began to understand that he had great worth in God's eyes. There was a joy I couldn't even describe. There was freedom. There was no more bondage. I can make choices on my own than being told what to do. We were actually human beings. We were people. After his release, Rick started making things right. He found a church home, stayed off drugs, and caught up with his child support. And in time, he was able to forgive his mother and found it freed him. Before she died, I was at peace with her. I could think for the first time, without somebody putting me down. I was actually living, and I hadn't lived in a long time. Rick has since remarried. He and Stephanie love being in their church choir, but spend most of their spare time with their two boys. I'm able to show Ricky and Jermaine how to be a good husband and good father, and that means the world to me. Rick knows he's made his share of mistakes, but he knows his self-worth is defined by God's love and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit is always reminding me, Rick, you're forgiven. Father God's giving you a clean slate. Jesus is sweeter than honey. And once you taste them, I promise you, you want more. Hey, that's triumph, isn't it? That's not defeat. The Lord is a God of victory. He's a God of triumph. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's what Paul said. You can be more than conquer, but in a sense, you've got to stop being a slave to something else. Rick was a slave to cocaine. He was a slave to the negative impulses that had come from his mother. He was a slave to the surroundings that he found himself in. You've got to come free. Do you want to be free? And the Lord says, I 
came that you might live. I came to give you a new life. And if you want it, I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for these in this audience who feel like they're trapped in bondage. I break the whole of those chains now and speak words of deliverance that they might come free in the name of Jesus now. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you want further literature, you want further prayer, I want you to call in. It's 1-800-759-0700. Toll free, no expense whatsoever. Thanks for being with us. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. And I want to leave you with these words from 1 John. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Well, tomorrow, we've got two Super Bowl champs to have a measure success as we look forward to the Super Bowl on Sunday. How do you measure success? Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.